one of the uh, kind of unstated kind of aspects I think in your book is like the aspect of irony. That mm -hmm. it's just it's just so fascinating when you think about like, and I'm thinking I had Love a irony. few times a conversation with members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and you always get this like, oh, you need to know your history, and it's like you don't know your own history. You 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 engaged in revisionism, or like you have this this passage in the book of like, um, well. If, African-American men would stop raping white women, everything would be better in the South. And you're like, what about the other way around? All the African-American women that get raped by mobs. And it's like, um, how do we not look at Southern history without thinking, especially when it comes to the Confederacy of irony and hypocrisy? I mean, I think irony may in some ways be a useful approach, um, to be honest. And, and I think the, um, I think when we approach the past, one thing that I do find very compelling is those moments of irony, um, those moments where, and the moments of hypocrisy, um, because they often highlight moments of lies. And I think that's why in many cases I find those moments of hypocrisy is because, you know, this, when a Sons of Confederate veteran member says something, frequently they're being sincere, not always, but frequently. I mean, I think we need to draw a line. We need to be clear that there's, there's, multiple types of neo-confederates. There are neo-confederates who, who who are misled in their understanding of history, and there are those that are, are totally insincere and using this as a recruitment mm -hmm. tool to drag people into uh, deeper and deeper radicalization, right? I mean, history is used as a radicalization tool, and that's why this matters. Right. To me, that's why this book matters so much, is that memory can be used to radicalize people. And so, um, in some ways, um, if this book does um, help debunk some of that bad history, then I've done my job as mm -hmm. well. Um, though that's not the only intent of the book. Um, but I, I do think uh, the irony that of, it also makes it fun in some ways as a historian, when to find the irony, right? When you have these funny lines where you have someone saying, ah, oh, in you know 1913, duty is the most sublime word of the English language. When you can turn around and find his letter to his sister where he says, I know it's my duty to go fight, but you know, I got this exemption. You can't expect me to go fight. Like there's a certain element of poking fun, right? I mean, in mm -hmm. some ways, and I, I did have to tone down in t at times uh, my own um, sort of, uh, my own uh, sort of cynicism. Yeah, and, and I, I toned it down. I did have to tone it down. This is something that the reviewers did a great job of working with me. I kept some of it because I do think, um, I think there is a value in having history be fun to read yeah. uh, and not just being clinical, to have a laugh here or there, mm -hmm. um, even if it's at the expense of a historical figure, um, can sometimes help us understand it better, mm -hmm. can help us, even if we, we, we may uh, push a little bit uh, and be, be selective in how we sort of present that irony, that, that sort of uh, juxtaposition, if you will, how I juxtapose mm -hmm. documents can lead to us sort of laughing. I think that's one way for us to sort of really see the past is that juxtaposition, is that mm -hmm. irony is a really good um, way of illustrating uh, lies as well. And so for me, um, I like to think that I draw that irony out at times um, especially in cases where it's, you know, the funnier lies, not necessarily in the sort of darker aspects. Um, you know, those I, those I can't really, you don't want to make fun of those because it's just dark. But on the sort of funnier aspects where someone is saying, you know, we fought so well, um, and then you have the document where their commanding officers like, the men don't listen to me. Um, like for me, those, those are the most in some ways compelling moments because they sort of demonstrate how much the narrative is fabrication. Not just that the lies are there, but just the way that the narrative is, uh, was, was fabricated in a way to serve a purpose, um, if that makes sense. And so, um, but I do, I do try to have a, a laugh or two in there um, as well. Um, Cause I do, I, I mean, it is something that, again, I want this book to be readable um, in a classroom. Um, I want this book to be readable by the general public um, because I do think that uh, in addition to having a contribution to the scholarship, that this book is a book that, um, and that was always my goal. It's a hard line to walk. I mean, you know, we talk about this a lot as scholars of do we write popular, do we write academic, and to write both um, is not easy, but that was my goal. And I don't know how well I succeeded, um, but, uh, but I, I, tried to, um, I tried to write with a little personality as well. Um, and I think 
I think it, it makes for a, a more enjoyable read when I get to sort of think about the reader. And I, I sort of think about readers like uh, Joanne Freeman or writers like Joanne Freeman who do something similar. She'll frequently do, um, there's sort of a, an almost, uh, if you ever listen to her read a book, she, she reads her most recent book on the audiobook version and you can hear her sort of start to giggle um, mm -hmm. at times as, as the punchline comes. And it's, it's great because you, she does a really good job of sort of showing that irony mm -hmm. um, as well in history. Um, and so I've, I've tried to mimic those writers that I find most compelling.